and welcome to this session of the Myron Meter Seminar Series. <clears throat> Hi to everyone online. Thank you for attending in person. Um, my name is Nora Lori. I'm an Associate Professor of International Relations at Boston University. I sit on the steering committee um, of the Inter-University Committee for International Migration, which has been around for all, uh, over 20 years now. Um, and it's a consortium between MIT, obviously, Brandeis, Tufts, Boston University, Boston College. Um, and we've had this Myron uh, Wiener seminar series since 2005. Um, and so um, if you haven't signed up for our listserv, please do. Um, I'll, I'll mention what our next talk is at the end of this session. Um, but I, I just want to, um, uh, before introducing uh, our speaker, just say thank you very much to MIT for hosting, and especially Sabina Van Mel for handling all of the logistics and making this seminar happen. Um, today, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our speaker. Uh, Professor Usman uh, Balkin is an Associate Director and Program Director of Curriculum, Experiential Learning, and Innovation at the Huntsman Program in International Studies and Business at the University of Pennsylvania. He is also an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and a senior fellow at the Lauder Institute for Management and International Studies. Um, today, his research um, and teaching focus on the politics of global migration, race and ethnicity, identity and inequality, political violence, and collective memory with a transregional concentration in Western Europe and um, the Middle East. And his, his research is really cutting edge and making us think beyond these boundaries um, across these continents. Um, and so I'm delighted that he's going to be talking about his wonderful book, Dying Abroad, The Political Afterlives of Migration in Europe, that came out with Cambridge uh, University Press this year, or 2003. So welcome, and uh, thank thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to the folks who are uh, Zooming in, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Today, I'm grateful also to Sabina for her help in making all the arrangements for my talk and to the Myron Wiener series for uh, hosting me for this uh, for this event. So thank you very much. Uh, as Nora mentioned, my talk today is based on uh, my new book, which is called Dying Abroad, uh, The Political Afterlives of Migration in Europe, uh, which came out in uh, March of 2023 uh, with Cambridge University Press as part of its LSE International series. International Studies series, uh, which is a series that prioritizes transdisciplinary approaches to international and transnational politics. Uh, so the book offers an ethnographic account of the complexities of death, dying, and burial in migratory settings, and analyzes the role that end-of-life practices play in the negotiation of social, political, and cultural boundaries. My focus is on Muslims of Turkish and Kurdish descent in Germany, uh, whose posthumous predicaments resonate with other minoritized communities in Western Europe and beyond. In spite of the great diversity of migratory origins, trajectories, and destinations, there are important commonalities in uh, what I call the experience of death out of place that speak to the ambivalent nature of home and belonging in the increasingly globalized world. And with this term, death out of place, I'm trying to capture something that is shared by immigrant communities and minority families who are confronting difficult end of life decisions in countries where they face structural barriers to political inclusion and equal social standards. As I hope to demonstrate today, uh, how families navigate this complicated terrain offers insight into the stakes of membership in national and religious communities, scope of sovereign power and authority, and the antinomies of citizenship and identity in contemporary multicultural societies. So as some of you might remember, uh, going back uh, a couple of years, that the complications and contradictions of death and dying in the context of international migration became the subject of newspaper headlines during the early months of the coronavirus pandemic, as governments across the world imposed lockdowns and border closures to mitigate the spread of the virus. So numerous countries enacted travel restrictions on both the living and the dead, suspending cross-border travel, as well as the cross-border repatriation of human remains. These decisions left many families in distress 
especially those who were unable to carry out uh, family members' dying wish to be buried in ancestral soils. Uh, but the newspaper headlines also drew attention to the severe shortage of burial grounds for religious minorities in countries of settlement. In France, a country with around 6 million Muslims, for example, less than 2% of the 35,000 municipal burial grounds have spaces dedicated to Islamic burials. In Germany, uh, this number is less than 1%. And although these stories may have given the impression that the uh, dilemmas faced by uh, these families were a product of the pandemic, the issues they spoke to were in fact long-standing concerns for minority communities. Perennial questions about the meaning of home and homeland take on a particular gravitas in death, especially for immigrants and their children. Moreover, the question of what is to be done with a loved one's mortal remains assumes even greater urgency when cultural or religious traditions prohibit cremation and mandate burial in perpetuity. So in other words, when bodies are expected to remain intact and also in one place. The act of burial confers a sense of fixity to identities that may be more fluid or ambivalent in life. It's a means to assert belonging, attachment, and perhaps even loyalty to a particular country, community, or place. And when the boundaries of a nation and its members are contested, burial decisions are political acts. But such decisions unfold within a myriad of overlapping and sometimes conflicting political institutions and cultural value systems. They involve a range of formal actors and informal networks. My book uh, starts from the premise that death and the rituals surrounding it provide an important window into the socioeconomic and political orders and hierarchies that structure human life in the 21st century. I argue that states, families, and religious communities all have a vested interest in the fate of dead bodies, including where and how they are buried, how they are commemorated. Further, I show that end-of-life practices are connected to broader political struggles over the boundaries of nations and the place of minoritized groups within them. Local burial in countries of settlement offers a symbolically powerful way for migrants and their children to assert political membership and to foster a sense of belonging. But the widespread practice of posthumous repatriation for burial in ancestral soils illustrates the continued importance of transnational ties and serves as an indictment of exclusionary socio-political orders. In both situations, whether it be local burial or repatriation, the corpse is central to localizing and grounding claims for political recognitions. At, a time, at times, this can be a highly contentious process where different actors clash over where dead bodies should go, what they might signify. Those who experience death out of place may face barriers to belonging in both the countries where they live and in those where they are purportedly from. How they attempt to resolve these contradictions in both life and in death reveals both the profound importance, but also the fundamental ambiguity of the meaning of home and homeland for transnational migrants and their kin. Now, this ambiguity is reflected in my own usage of the qualified and admittedly awkward phrase Muslims of Turkish, Kurdish, Muslims of Turkish and Kurdish descent from Germany uh, to describe my interlocutors. While it would be misleading to characterize these communities as immigrants, given that uh, several generational cohorts were born in Germany and hold German citizenship, like other minoritized and racialized populations, such as the descendants of Caribbean and South Asian migrants in Britain or North Africans in France, Muslims of Turkish and Kurdish descent in Germany remain outside of dominant national imaginaries. And in a political climate that is marked by rising xenophobia, national chauvinism, and anti Muslim racism, the phrase Muslims of Turkish and Kurdish descent is meant to underscore a fundamental tension at the heart of public debates surrounding immigration, race, religion, and identity in Europe today. As other scholars have observed, and uh, uh, here I'm putting up a set of books that have been, have been influential 
to my own thinking about uh, issues of race and migration in, in Europe. As other scholars have observed, uh, such qualifiers are an effect of what many believe to be the incommensurability of categories such as German and Muslim or Muslim and European. Similar to what Lisa Lowe has indexed with reference to Asian Americans in the United States, Muslims in Germany are seen by many Germans as perpetual immigrants, eternal newcomers, or as the foreigner with them. Now, given this context, I sought to better understand how Muslim communities in Germany managed and made sense of death and dying in a country where they did not always feel at home. I took an ethnographic approach uh, to this question, uh, conducting 15 discontinuous months of field work in Berlin and Istanbul between 2013 and 17. And in Germany, I studied the evolution of the Islamic funeral industry, working alongside Muslim undertakers at several Islamic funeral homes and participating in every aspect of their day-to-day -day work. I assisted them in funeral ceremonies, uh, helping to transport and bury deceased Muslims at a number of different cemeteries in Berlin. Together, we also prepared corpses for international repatriation and delivered them to Berlin area airports for shipment on cargo and commercial flights. During my research, I also visited dozens of cemeteries in Germany and several other European countries to learn about patterns of posthumous memorialization. I photographed more than a thousand tombstones in Germany, Belgium, Spain, Sweden, and the Netherlands to create a visual ethnographic archive of the physical landscapes of burial and commemoration, what I refer to as Europe's Islamic deathscapes. I conducted semi structured interviews with bereaved families, government officials, religious leaders, medical practitioners, and representatives of Islamic funeral funds all in an effort to better understand the role that end-of-life practices play in the negotiation of social, political, and cultural boundaries. And alongside these formal interviews, I also had countless informal conversations with community members during visits to ethnic and cultural associations, youth centers, mosques, restaurants, and cafes, which ultimately helped shape the direction of my research too. In Turkey, uh, meanwhile, I spent three months conducting field work in Istanbul to learn more about the receiving end of the repatriation process. There, I was able to interview municipal cemetery administrators and to accompany undertakers to the airport to pick up bodies that had been shipped from overseas. I attended and observed uh, several funeral ceremonies and visited nearly a dozen municipal cemeteries to better understand differences in funerary rites and memorialization practices. And while I won't uh, go into it right now, I, I'd be happy to address questions about my own positionality and strategies for conducting uh, field work in the Q&A if any of you are interested in methodological issues surrounding uh, ethnographic and qualitative research. But in the time that I have uh, uh, remaining, let me walk you through the book and some of its major arguments, and I'll be happy to, to answer any questions that you may have. So, um, the first half of the book uh, focuses on the legal, institutional, and economic aspects of death out of place, or what might be understood as the material conditions of death burial and end of life care in migratory settings. So, chapter one examines the work of Islamic funeral funds in uh, Europe, which provide uh, logistical and financial support for the cross border transportation of Muslim corpses. Behind me are some advertisements for uh, two of these funeral funds that I'll explain in a moment. These institutions emerged in tandem with the aging of the first generation of Muslim immigrants in Western Europe in the 1990s, and the recognition for uh, the growing need uh, for culturally and religiously appropriate funeral services. So my focus in this chapter is on two of the largest and most important funds in Europe whose combined membership is nearly 500,000 members across Western Europe. Uh, these funds are administered by two long-standing uh, Turkish Islamic civil society associations, who, in addition to providing funerary services, offer a wide range of religious, educational, and cultural services, such as the organization of Hajj pilgrimages and Eid celebrations, as well as Quran courses, language training, and professional education. 
So drawing on interviews with fund administrators and close readings of primary sources, such as promotional literature, advertisements, membership contracts, I examined the different strategies and practices through which these institutional, uh, these organizations institutionalize at some point and at some points incentivize and also justify fostering this repatriation precarity. And I argue that by incentivizing cross-border repatriation, these institutions help to affirm the symbolic connection between the dead body and the nation and help legitimize the idea that the dead belong in a particular place, engaging in a form of what I call necropatriotism. So uh, the two ads that you see on this slide, the one um, on the left is by one fund administered by BITIC, uh, which is connected to the Ministry of Religious Affairs in Turkey. And this one reads, uh, you know, with more than 200,000 members, have you not yet become a member of BITIC's funeral fund? If you haven't, you should hurry up and do so because death was not announced when it will arrive. And on the one on the right, this is by another fund, um, which was started by Ikba, which is a, a Islamic society association connected to the political movement Midi Burish. And that uh, advertisement reads that on your most painful day, we are by your side. You see on the bottom there, it shows the kind of streamlined images of the kind of processes involved in death burial re repatriation, including, you know, attending to bureaucratic procedures and the airplanes symbolizing the transfer of the religious uh, uh, rituals and rites. And so these funds essentially, um, when you become a member, uh, there's different criteria for membership uh, and membership fees vary by age uh, and so on. Uh, but when you become a member, when you die, the fund will take care of all the practical and logistical operations connected to um, uh, your burial or your repatriation. And funds differ. Some of them will provide um, funding for local burial in Germany or in, in Europe, wherever they're based. Uh, some of them will not, which is a, an important factor, I think, in driving uh, burial decisions. But just to give you a sense of how they justify uh, you know, their founding and the um, you know, the, the reason for existence. Uh, this is a quote from uh, one of the founding documents of the uh, BTIP's funeral fund, which reads that, you know, it was established in 1992. Uh, this is about 30 years after the first uh, large scale wave of Turkish guest local migration to Germany. So established in 1992 to provide a lasting practical and secure solution the serious problem faced by our people who having spent a lifetime in Gilbert, which doesn't have a very easy English translation, but means something like um, exile tinged with a kind of melancholic longing for the homeland. So faced by our people who having spent a lifetime in Gilbert and out of a longing for their homeland, desire to have their bodies repatriated to our country for burial. In a very short time, this fund has provided the mutual support and solidarity desired amongst our citizens and has been the object of great interest and respect. So this is kind of how they justify their founding for their mission. And, um, you know, I wasn't able to collect a lot of empirical data on the uh, fund membership or the burial outcomes. In certain years, they had uh, posted uh, essentially, um, the, uh, what percentage of the fund members were buried locally or repatriated. So in these two years, uh, you can see uh, this is the burial outcomes of fund members in Germany, for example. You see that the vast majority are repatriated for burial. That's in part uh, due to the fact that this fund uh, doesn't cover the costs associated with local burial in Germany. Uh, but there are other factors that influence burial outcomes as well in the side of the project to innovate. But so these funds are one of the kind of important institutional actors that facilitate, organize, and set the conditions of possibility for Islamic communities. Um, the next set of actors that I looked at were Muslim undertakers. So the second chapter in the book uh, focuses on Muslim undertakers the bureaucracy of death, the Islamic funeral industry in Germany. So as I mentioned before, my ethnographic research included some participant observation with 
several Islamic funeral homes in Berlin. Uh, is the image of one of the storefronts of one of the funeral homes uh, where I did some research. This is in the neighborhood of Neukölln in Berlin, a neighborhood that is known for its multicultural, uh, multinational population. Um, during the field work, I attended, observed, and took part in all aspects of the undertaker's work, uh, from participating um, in local burials uh, and also preparing uh, bodies for international shipment and international repatriation. Um, here you see some images of, uh, on the left. This is uh, in, in the morgue uh, where the, the uh, casket has been packaged and is being ready to be shipped out. And the picture on the right there is taken at the Schoenefeld Airport being loaded into a cargo uh, carrier for um, shipment back to Turkey. Um, I should point out that in many Muslim majority countries, funeral services are part of the welfare state. The funerals are typically conducted within 24 hours of an individual's death. Uh, but the establishment of a private market for Islamic funerals in Germany is really a novel consequence of migration from Muslim majority countries to Germany. This was a kind of a niche where uh, the long, uh, longer established funeral homes um, didn't really have the capacity to attend to the cultural needs of uh, the Muslim communities. So a lot of these undertakers uh, saw an opportunity for uh, developing a business, and this is how they got into the work. But uh, through my conversations uh, with the undertakers and through my interviews, I came to understand that their work takes on political salience in multicultural societies where Different, different ethnic and religious groups have divergent views on death and dying, on end of life care, and also the proper treatment of corpses. So in situations where there's some uncertainty about funerary traditions or burial laws, undertakers play a critical role in guiding families through the religious, political, and legal landscapes that structure the transitions from life to death. So the undertakers that I uh, worked with served as political and cultural intermediaries between Muslim communities and the German state in two important ways. First, they helped socialize their customers to the norms and values underlying the German legal rational order and its associated expectations. So the bureaucracy of death in this sense functions not only as an institution that is particularly emblematic of a legal rational order, but also reflects a broader socio-cultural structure with associated attitudes, mannerisms, dispositions, and sensibilities. In other words, uh, the bureaucracy of death reflects a particular way of being properly German or properly integrated. I'll elaborate on these points in just a moment. But the second uh, uh, function of you know, mediation, they, the Muslim undertakers offer lessons about Muslim citizens to the German state by countering derogatory stereotypes about Islam and Muslims in Germany. Through their daily encounters and conversations with civil servants, with agents of the German bureaucracy, uh, they dispel widely held myths and negative perceptions about Islam and Muslims. And when burying the dead and tending to the li living, the Muslim undertakers of Berlin work to reconcile competing and sometimes conflicting sets of administrative and cultural norms surrounding death and burial. So, for example, as I mentioned earlier, while Muslims believe that the deceased should be buried as soon as possible after death, which usually is taken to mean practically within 24 or 48 hours, German laws require a mandatory 48 hour waiting period which in practice can actually take much longer if there are concerns about the cause of death. Likewise, uh, while Muslims believe that individuals should be buried without a coffin, there are many states in Germany mandate the use of a coffin for burial. So in reconciling these and other issues, uh, the Muslim undertakers of Berlin preside not just over end-of-life decisions and their theological implications, but over pedagogical moments of political and socio-cultural integration in contemporary Germany. Their ability to navigate the regulatory structures of the German bureaucracy and the cultural expectations of their customers is both a defining feature of their occupational identity 
and a principal source of a professional authority. So let me give you a few examples from my uh, interviews with the undertakers to illustrate what I have in mind. So here's one of the folks that I was working with in Oregon. So as one undertaker, uh, who I'll call Brilliant, told me with reference to the attitudes and expectations of his customers, he said, quote, we live in a Muslim, in a non-Muslim, sorry, country, Asian Muslim country, there are laws, we have to go to government agencies, this isn't a village. When someone dies, we can't just bury them that afternoon. The government agencies in Germany are open in the morning and closed in the afternoon. And think about it, you need to go pick up the body from the hospital, take care of all the official procedures. And the whole system works by appointment. It's not a village, you can't just call the imam and say, let's get it over with. He went on to say that our people have been living here for 50 years, they could live here for another 150 years, and they wouldn't understand the system of the country that they live in. They don't understand the German system, nor do they want to understand it, because whatever pre-existing mentality they brought with them from Anatolia, the village mentality, it's still there. So here's a, a, an undertaker who himself is an immigrant from Anatolia, reflecting basically on the attitudes, manners, and sensibilities of their customers, their expectations about the rules and regulations surrounding death and burial, and kind of ascribing a normative judgment about uh, you know, their lack of ability to understand the society that they have lived in for 50 years. Um, so for Binant and the other undertakers, the bureaucracy is an inescapable aspect of the day-to-day -day work. It's at once a source of frustration and uh, also the basis of their authority. So though they might be impeded and annoyed by the endless amount of paperwork and the difficulty of coordinating across a myriad of different governmental agencies, they are committed to the logic and practice of a bureaucratic order. Their ability to navigate the intricacies of the bureaucracy of death is intrinsic to their role as cultural mediators is a central feature of their occupational identity and expertise. So mastery or know-how of the logic of bureaucracy furnishes individuals with a cultural capital that can be used as a resort in the pursuit of economic gain. But to be fair, uh, the bureaucracy of death in Germany is quite complex. Uh, Mehmet, another undertaker who uh, uh, described to me the steps leading up between a person's death and burial, he put it this way. He said that in um, some municipalities, the Standesamt, the civil registration office, are closed on Wednesdays and Fridays. We can't do anything on those days. And on Thursdays, they're only open in the afternoon after 2 p.m. So if you have a death on a Tuesday and you want to repatriate the body, the earliest it will go out is the following Monday, because the Standesamt is closed on Wednesday. On Thursday, it opens at 2, but by the time I'm finished there, the consulate is closed. Let's see. Uh, uh, on Friday, the Standesamt is closed, and everything is closed over the weekend, so we'll have to wait until Monday. If someone dies on a Monday, however, we can usually ship the body the next day without all of these problems. So you see here uh, how basically the uh, bureaucratic uh, time of these governmental agencies comes into conflict with the biological rhythms of life and death, and how in this sense, uh, as Noah has written about too, time becomes a mechanism by which to discipline uh, uh, subjects, right, by uh, either making them wait or uh, basically not uh, moving in accordance with the logic of the biological order. But what I find uh, compelling in the Undertaker's stories is, you know, in spite of this sort of Kafkaesque bureaucracy, how they are personally imbricated in the reproduction of a bureaucratized vision of socio-political life. So in mediating encounters between minority citizens in the state, they help translate and disseminate the political norms of the state and also work to enforce them. So they're sort of disciplinary agents themselves. So in this sense, the work of undertaking is not simply a matter of bearing bodies. In their interactions with their customers, the Muslim undertakers of Berlin preside over pedagogical moments of political and socio-cultural integration in Germany. 
But uh, as I mentioned earlier, the mediating role played by the undertakers is multi-directional. Remember that they work not only with minority communities, but with state officials as well. So in the course of their day-to-day -day tasks, they have numerous personal interactions with German bureaucrats, a number of different venues, and work hand-in-hand -hand with various agencies and agents of the German state. Another dimension of the mediating role involves combating negative stereotypes about Muslims in Germany by presenting themselves as responsible, professional, well-integrated, and knowledgeable individuals. Muslim undertakers attempt to demystify popular assumptions about Islam and Muslims in Germany. And in some cases, they take on the role of a spokesperson and pedagogue willingly. In others, they find themselves in a position where they feel compelled to speak on behalf of others. So uh, one undertaker who I will call Ismail uh, explained it to me in the following terms. He said, <clears throat> I teach a lot of classes in hospitals and police stations about the things that people should pay attention to when there's a dying Muslim. Since 9-11, people in Germany get a little uneasy when they hear the word Muslim, and I try to alleviate these fears in the classes. I went on to say that, you know, Germans are really afraid of uh, Muslims. Uh, after those events in the U.S., they're even more afraid. And so if someone says, Bismillah rahman rahim the Germans will look around and say, you know, what's going on here? Is there a bomb? In the courses that I teach, I try to take away this fear. Uh, so for Ismail, uh, negative stereotypes about Muslims in Germany are pervasive and have only, only been heightened in the post 9 era. He sees a need to correct unfavorable ideas about Muslims by educating those who have regular contact with Muslims in their kind of work, such as medical practitioners, police officers. So one technique that he employs is explicitly pedagogical. He visits hospitals, speaks with staff members, his goal there is to educate them about Islamic death rites and rituals so that they can provide proper end of life care. But another strategy involves his own self presentation. So uh, he said, you know, most people who visit my funeral home expect to see a bearded man, a hajjibhujan, which is kind of like a slang for an ostentatious uh, religious figure. But when they see me, they are surprised, he said. Uh, they ask me, wait, you're a Muslim? Uh, because they were expecting someone with a big beard, and then he left. You know? uh, so he expressed a certain pleasure in this kind of misrecognition by not conforming to the expected image of a Muslim undertaker who challenges preconceptions about what a Muslim should look like. But in embodying and presenting an alternative Islamic identity, Ismail hopes to dispel some of the myths that circulate in the German public sphere. But as an undertaker, he doesn't you know, represent any particular group or community, but he willingly embraces the role of a public figure with a political mission. In challenging expectations about Muslims in Germany, he provides a sort of corrective cultural mediation. So I'm happy to say more also about the undertakers in the Q&A if people are interested in learning more, but let me move on. Now to the second half of my book, uh, which examines the symbolic and cultural dimensions of death time in various and migratory contexts. So in these chapters, I'm particularly interested in processes of placemaking and identity construction that are evident in the rituals and ceremonies accompanying acts of burial and memorialization. The third um, chapter of the book offers a visual ethnography of Islamic burial grounds in Europe and focuses on representations of religious, ethnic, and national identities on the tombstones of Muslim graves. Here I try to illustrate the central role that cemeteries play in the construction of diasporic memory and collective identity by analyzing tombstones located in several Islamic burial grounds in Germany and other Western European countries. So as I mentioned before, uh, in spite of the long-term settlement of Muslims in Europe, Islamic cemeteries are still extremely rare in the continent. So in Germany, less than 1% of the country's approximately 32,000 burial grounds have dedicated spaces for Muslims. Um, uh, this image is the uh, plaque that is located at the entrance to one of these uh, burial sections, uh, which is located in Berlin, Berlin's uh, Gato Spandau Cemetery, 
you can see here the multilingual inscription with um, text in German, Turkish, and Arabic. Um, so this was one of the places where I was photographing a lot of tombstones. So even though they are uncommon, uh, these spaces are suffused with deep cultural meaning. These are places where the physical landscape is symbolically inscribed and re-signified. And so uh, for that reason, Islamic burial grounds offer insight in the changing contours of political membership and identity in an increasingly multicultural European societies. They are places where ethno-religious minorities assert their national presence. And in doing so, they help normalize symbols of national religious and linguistic diversity in contemporary Europe. So to show you a few examples um, of these tombstones, uh, graves were marked as Islamic through the use of religious epitaphs such as Wihuna Fatiha or simply Fatiha, which is a reference to the first chapter of the Quran and an injunction for passers-by to pray for the souls of the deceased. So the act of writing Fatiha on a tombstone not only marks the individual deceased as Muslim, but also situates her within the broader collective Islamic community by instigating communicative action between the deceased and other members of the Muslim community. The Fatiha signals the existence of a Muslim identity while simultaneously entreating other Muslims to profess and perform their own Islamic identities through ritualistic acts of prayer. By acknowledging the deceased as Muslim and by praying for the souls of all Muslims, uh, the pious visitor to an Islamic cemetery reflexively produces the wider Islamic community through these symbolic uh, actions. Perhaps it is unsurprising that Muslim graves would utilize religious language in memorializing an individual as this practice is quite common in other religious faiths too, such as uh, the Christian practice of marking uh, the salvation of Jesus Christ on the tombstones. But what was more surprising uh, to me, at least, was the presence of national flags and tombstones in the shape of mosques that I'll come to in a moment. In places where commemorative practices are more explicitly shaped by the state, so like military cemeteries or tombs for the unknown soldier, um, the utilization of national flags on or near tombstones is perhaps a calculated strategy to bolster patriotic sentiment. It also serves as a reminder of the state's sovereign power, its authority uh, and power over life and death. How then uh, might we interpret the fact that the flags marking Europe's Muslim dead are affixed not to the graves of soldiers and statesmen, but rather to the tombstones of ordinary civilians? These private acts of commemoration nationalize the dead and situate them within a particular political community. They can be read as symbols of real or aspirational patriotism. You might never know uh, whether or not the individual in question harbored strong patriotic sentiment. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this is less important than the message conveyed by the existence of a flag on a tombstone, which links the dead to a specific country. The flag is a recognizable visual marker that has the potential to reach a larger audience than an epitaph or an inscription particularly if the text of uh, the inscription is written in a language that is unintelligible to the observer. So many of these tombstones had inscriptions in non-German uh, languages. Flags are powerful symbols of national belonging that communicate a range of emotional attachments to nation states and political communities. And in minority burial grounds and migratory settings, the flag of a foreign country sends a strong and potentially paradoxical message to visitors. Like the common practice of indicating a foreign place of birth, the flag's presence on a tombstone acknowledges histories of migration and signals membership in other political communities. Yet these graves are also a testament to the fact that the repatriation is not pursued, right? These are graves in Germany, with you know, Turkish and Palestinian flags on. So finally, a particular uh, peculiar and innovative grave form that I observed in Islamic cemeteries across Europe uh, was the mosque grave. So mosque graves, uh, you know, these graves in the shape of mini mosques, transform the landscape of European cemeteries by imbuing them with new religious iconography. 
for a stunning example of what art historian Christy Buber has called Islamic architecture on the move. But what sort of politics is present in the construction of mini mosques and public cemeteries? As I read it, the use of Islamic architectural elements like the mosque grave is in part a response to the social and political challenges faced by Muslim communities across Europe. In recent decades, the visibility of Islamic symbols, such as the headscarf in the European public sphere has generated much political controversy. Efforts to build actual mosques and sites of worship have been undermined by those who see the presence of Islamic buildings as a threat to the purportedly secular landscape of the European public sphere. The incorporation of religious architecture and design in the public space of the cemetery can be understood as one strategy through which Muslim communities across the continent express their religious faith it also represents an innovative step towards the normalization of Islamic symbols in the European landscape. Just as Muslim tombstones may display features of syncretism and assimilation to dominant cultures, they also showcase the ways in which Islamic elements become subtly incorporated into the urban fabric. And rather than assuming that the expression of national, ethnic, or religious affiliation is simply evidence of cultural retention or communalism or lack of assimilation. I think it's helpful to understand uh, these gestures as evidence of the changing nature of European identity. So read in this light, expressions of Islam in places like Berlin, Brussels, or Stockholm are not instantiations of an outside extraneous or foreign culture. They are reflections of an evolving and dynamic multicultural and multi-confessional society. While mosques and minarets might currently seem out of place, both in the cemetery or in the city, their proliferation has the potential to neutralize their effect. In the future, they might be as unremarkable as the crosses and church towers that are an integral part of Europe's urban landscape. By burying their dead in Germany and elsewhere in Europe, ethnic and religious minorities claim European soils as their own. And though their tombstone stones might display markers of alterity and difference, their corpses attest the fact that they are here to stay. So uh, having taken you on a brief tour of Europe's Islamic deathscapes, let me now turn to the fourth and final section of my book, which investigates the different factors uh, that influence family decisions about where to bury their loved ones and the significance they ascribe to the location of burial. So in explaining their own burial preferences and reflecting on the decisions of others, my interview partners emphasize the role of the family, the significance of territory and soil, and one's own structural position within German society as the most important factors that influence burial outcomes. These factors lend credence to my interviewee's attachments to Turkey and to Germany, and were central in their narratives about the significance of life, death, and burial in the context of migration. So let me share a few quotes from my interviews to show you what I have in mind. And I was particularly interested in these conversations about how people narrativize their own you know, burial preferences and how they reflected on the decisions of others. In other words, you know, what kind of uh, reasons or logics or justifications were they setting forward and uh, what did they think uh, it signified to be buried locally or to have a body repatriated? So uh, corporeal assertions of belonging deploy the body as an anchor. So in some cases, the dead are anchored by their children. So as one uh, elderly woman whom I interviewed in a retirement home told me that, quote, when I die, I want to be buried here. My children are here. A man uh, that I interviewed at a Kurdish cultural center expressed concern that no one would honor his memory by visiting his grave if he were repatriated for the burial. He said that the villages are empty. If you're buried in Germany, someone can visit you every week or on the holidays. They can leave some flowers on your grave or at the very least, just come and look at it. And just as uh, future generations, so we're here we're thinking about children or, or the future living, uh, just as future generations can anchor the dead, the dead can also anchor future generations. So some of my respondents thought that repatriation was actually preferable to local burial 
because it would encourage the children and grandchildren of the deceased to maintain some kind of emotional connection to their ancestral soils. So a retired Turkish nurse who came to Germany as a young child said that her husband, quote, wants to be buried in his homeland so our children can visit him and maintain ties to Turkey. Although she herself wanted to be buried in Germany, she wondered aloud whether it would be buried to, uh, better to be buried alongside her husband in Turkey for the sake of their children. When you become a mother or a father, she told me with a smile, you think of your children even after death. Uh, two Alevi religious leaders that I spoke to also emphasized the importance of maintaining intergenerational connections to ancestral lands through the practice of repatriation for burial. So during our lengthy conversation, they stressed the importance of land, soil, and historical memory. Our graves are our genealogical records, one of them told me. Quote, I know my great-great-grandfather's grave. For me, this is history. I don't have to ask anyone. I can go there and see 200, 250 years of history. My child sees it too, and for him, the grave is a reference point. For us Alevis, this is very important. So the village cemeteries in Turkey thus served as an important reference for Alevis in the diaspora, offering material proof of their history and genealogy. These religious leaders supported repatriation precisely because it helped preserve historical memory and genealogical continuity in a migratory context. While different ideas about family and communal continuity result in different burial outcomes, among all my interview partners, there was a recognition that the dead anchor the living by conferring historical depth and significance to particular places and soils. So when articulating why they thought it was important to maintain these ties and connections, some of my interview partners invoked the centrality of the physical landscape. So the mountains, the soil, the air and water are completely different. You even miss the stones. A uh, Turkish woman in her 50s who had immigrated to Berlin as a child told me in justifying her decision to be repatriated for burial. Another interviewee, an elderly Kurdish man, uh, recounted to me that, quote, the soil is honor and wealth. It means everything. And in describing why he wanted to be buried in this familiar village, he reasoned that, quote, I was born in that soil and I will return to it. That's my own view, at least. That's where I was born. Sometimes my wife would tell me, let's get buried in Germany if that's what our kids want. But I say, forget about it. Bring us back to the homeland. When I die, I want to be brought back to the homeland so that when I rot and I'm eaten, it's the bugs and the ants from my village that eat me. That's what I always say. Some of my respondents viewed the decision to be buried in Germany as a coming to terms with the decades long process of settlement and integration. So, as one of my uh, informants, who's a Kurdish man in his mid 40s, who organizes funerals for the Kurdish community in Berlin, has been living in Germany for more than 15 years, told me, uh, specifically with reference to the third generation, that, quote, they are here for good, God forbid, uh, but when they die, uh, they are buried here. This proves that they are here to stay. They aren't immigrants. They are permanent members of this society. He told me that in an earlier era, only stillborn babies uh, were buried in Germany, but that increasingly adults were buried there too. For people who live here, he observed, uh, this place is a part of them. This is a reality. Germany has become like a homeland. We feel freer here. We can speak more freely. End quote. But others felt differently. Uh, one of my interview partners, who is a successful entrepreneur in his early 40s, who owns and operates a series of restaurants in Berlin, told me that, quote, our soil is there in Turkey. I want to be buried there too. I grew up here in Germany, but that is our story. We live here, we do everything here, but this place never fully accepted us and it never will. It's impossible, really impossible. That's why we're always foreigners. So what's the point of being buried in a foreign country? Now here in this quote, you see how the link between social exclusion and the desire for posthumous repatriation is made explicit stating that it's impossible for him to be fully accepted in German society, uh, he seeks refuge in a soil over which he claims ownership. And in this account, social death generates a longing for belonging, 
which can only be achieved after biological death and return to the native soil for burial. Another interview partner, a retired Turkish factory worker in his mid 60s, put it even more bluntly. Let me be honest, he said, I've been scorned in Germany, I've been despised and disparaged. That's why I want to be buried where I was born. I have a homeland. Why should I be buried here? Whenever something happens in Germany, they always blame the Turks. My grave should be in Turkey. I'm determined. If my family wants to join me, fine. If not, it doesn't matter. I was always Auslander. I was always a foreigner. And I don't want to be an Auslander in my grave. So both these statements you know, exemplify a potential disconnect that exists between formal legal membership through citizenship and a sense of belonging in a political community. Experiences with racism, discrimination, or xenophobia generate feelings of perpetual foreignness, a stigma which follows individuals to the grave. In such contexts, repatriation might be read as an act of defiance that signals the rejection of a political community that excludes. On the other hand, uh, the post posthumous homecomings that is imagined in these accounts belies the profound disillusionment that can characterize return journeys, a disillusionment that grows in proportion to the gulf between nostalgia and reality. But in either case, these narratives illustrate how membership and belonging to political and national communities is structured and made meaningful through end of life rituals and postmodern practices. So uh, to conclude, as I hope I've uh, shown a bit today, uh, well, death is undoubtedly a universal shared ex human experience. It poses distinct challenges for minoritized communities and migratory settings. <clears throat> Death out of place foregrounds questions that are central to the intergenerational experience of migration. Who am I and where do I belong? For members of the Muslim minority communities who are the interlocutors of my book, the complex web of interests, institutions, and emotions that accompany the rupture of death out of place through the funeral industry and its engagement with state bureaucracy, the choice between repatriation or local burial, and the symbolic act of commemoration for a grave marker exemplifies how national identity in a transnational world is ambiguously resolved even in death, neither obviously here nor there. So thank you very much for your attention, and I, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Great. So um, we have about 20 minutes for questions. I see. Uh, um, so I'm pretty sure online participants have to use the Q&A box. I see that uh, um, we have a hand up, but I don't think we can hear. Our... Yeah, that's <laughs> if they use the Q&A. Um, Anna, if you can hear us, Anna Hardman is also on the committee. She has a question. Um, if you don't mind typing it out, we'll uh, be able to read it. Um, but let me see if there's anyone in the room who has some questions, and please um, introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, my name is Alani Yan. Um, I'm a staff member at MIT Libraries. So I studied anthropology and forensics. Uh, and I, I loved this talk. It's very interesting. I'll definitely read your book afterwards. Um, and I was wondering if you had any insights as to how age uh, played a factor in whether people decided that they maybe wanted to be repatriated or remain in the country that they immigrated to? It's a good question. Uh, you know, so when I was visiting these uh, cemeteries uh, around Germany and around Europe, you know, I was struck sometimes uh, by graves that I saw of stillborn babies, you know, just a few days old, or, um, some of which had, you know, flags on, on the tombstone, right? And so I was always struck by, you know, that link between a kind of a future foreclosed for the parents, uh, uh, but still that act of marking the dead uh, as part of this national community, even though it was, uh, you know, a, a person who did not have the chance to, to live out their life. So, you know, what one of the undertakers I spoke to was saying is that, you know, stillborn children were for many years the kind of only, uh, uh, you know, you'd, you'd see those graves, uh, they were common in German cemeteries. But I think, um, you know, increasingly it's, it's, it's more common. I, I, I did see uh, spread, you know, graves of younger people and older people. So it's difficult 
uh, really to, to generalize, but I think that on the whole, if, if I want to step back and think about broader trends, right? We saw in the figures with the uh, funeral funds, how the fund members are still repatriated at a, at a much higher rate owing to some different kind of structural incentives. But uh, on the whole, I think there is um, a shift that is happening where families are preferring local burial. Although the, the majority, uh, uh, when I speak to the undertakers, they tell me that the majority of their business is still around repatriation. So I'm not sure how exactly to, to say that age factors into this, um, but I did see you know a wide range of ages. I think for a question. Wonderful. So I'll take one from online and then I'll come, I'll come to the audience again. So. Anna Hardman, who's on the committee, asks, I found your talk very interesting and informative. It made me think about parallels in other migrant host countries. My question, you quoted Belent um, talking about, quote unquote, village mentality of migrants in Germany who are unhappy about slow bureaucracy. Is this a reflection of social class within the immigrant community that undertakers are or feel a different social class from those with, you know, the quote unquote, um, Village mentality. Yes, it's a great question. Uh, so the trope of the Anatolian village was a kind of a recurring, recurring theme uh, that came up in my interviews. And the Anatolian village notion was a kind of a placeholder that stood in for pre-modern, unassimilated, uh, you know, someone who wasn't integrated, someone who's basically like a country pumpkin. Um, and it was um, an interesting, uh, trope because uh, you know the undertaker whose quote I read, uh, Bulan was himself a kind of a uh, proudly uh, originated from a uh, central Anatolian village, right? And so um, I don't know if there's a bit of projection there what he was uh, getting at, but um, uh, so you know he was maybe his kind of proximity to some of the people that he was criticizing. Uh, his proximity in terms of origin or social class uh, allowed him to speak more freely and critically and, and frankly in a kind of a derogatory uh, way about the kind of attitudes and expectations of, um, uh, of a community of which he considered himself to be a part as well. But for him, you know, he had actually figured out the rules, the laws, the bureaucracy. And for him, that was part of his both his occupational uh, identity, but also what gave him a sense of professional authority, right? his ability to, to better understand or uh, to understand as well as the German bureaucrats, uh, the logic of the bureaucratic order, and to explain these to his customers, right? But um, often it came in the form, you know, these kind of pedagogical interventions. Uh, it, it was like the the tone that was struck was one of the frustrated teachers. Like, I keep telling you, but you just don't understand. You know, uh, why don't you know that the offices are closed on the weekend, right? You've been here for 50 years, you should know this by now. Um, so, um, I, I think, you know, uh, I read this in light of, you know, how a particular uh, logic of a, rash, a rational, legal rational order in, in the Bavarian sense, right? Uh, how this is not simply about, um, you know, laws and regulations and institutions, right, that uh, structure interactions between citizens and the state. But what I read into the uh, legal rational order was that this comes with the associated set of mannerisms or expectations about how one ought to con conduct oneself, right? in the presence of, of bureaucracy, right? Uh, what you could expect or assume uh, about how things worked. And uh, where I found this interesting link to ideas about assimilation or integration was that um, uh, the degree to which an individual either sort of understood or didn't understand the bureaucratic order was in a sense for the undertakers, a marker of the level of broader sociocultural knowledge, right? And in this, you know, in a way they are um, 
as you can see, reproducing some of the common tropes about immigrants who, you know, whose dispositions, whose attitudes are, are basically like these portable dispositions that they bring with them from the homeland and they just try to live their lives as if they're still back from where they came from. This is a common uh, thing that you hear in public in discourse about, you know, immigrant communities don't understand the way things uh, work here and they're not adjusting and they're resisting, right? So in a way he was echoing some of the talking points you see from people who are critical of uh, immigrant communities from a position of being himself an immigrant from the very Anatolian villages, he um, uh, the mentalities that he's criticizing. So, I in the book I, I write uh, a bit longer about this, and I think about the way that strategically positioned actors who serve as cultural mediators, right, um, in a sense, are part and parcel of the reproduction of certain logics of state order, right, uh, and the fact that they are dealing from the very immigrant communities that are targets of state intervention, right? Uh, allows them uh, uh, maybe to act uh, knowingly or unknowingly as part of the pedagogical arm of the state. Right? But remember that the mediation works the other way too, because they're constantly dealing with bureaucrats and dispelling myths about Muslims and Islam in Germany. So it's a kind of a two-way uh, mediation that I think that we can think about other kind of ethnic entrepreneurs as a rich literature on, on the work that ethnic entrepreneurs uh, perform as a kind of cultural mediation. I see the undertakers as part and parcel of this broader um, kind of like uh, middle uh, branch between civil society and the state. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I was curious um, if you don't mind introducing oh, yourself. Okay. Actually, um, I'm I'm a community member. Um, uh, so I've, I've worked in death and dying. I, I've worked with the funeral industry um, in the United States. Um, and I'm curious if you looked at it from like a financial perspective, considering that funerals are so expensive, and who had access to these types of um, dispositions, yes. um, and whether it was targeting certain demographics or within. So yeah, I, this was an important consideration, and this is something I wrote a lot about in the chapter on the, the Undertakers about the, basically the funeral market in Germany and the kind of uh, modification of death and uh, all the attendant expenses uh, surrounding you know funeral and burial ceremonies. Uh, something that the Undertakers repeated to me all the time, and I, I, I sort of when you confirm this is that uh, their prices were you know, far too low, right? Uh, compared to what they called, you know, the German companies, right? So these are companies uh, like Ahorn Gneisen, these longer established German uh, funeral companies that have uh, been around for a hundred years or more. Uh, you know, they would say things like, if you go to one of these companies, you're going to get an itemized bill where they're even going to charge you for the nails that they used to see in the coffin, right? This was the kind of things they tell me. Um, and they'd say, you're going to pay 10,000 euros there, but uh, with us, you know, you're going to pay, you know, 2,000 euros or something like this. And they also chided their uh, competitors, other Muslim undertakers, because they said, you know, every time you have someone new enter the market, they try to slash the prices even more, and now we're fighting over a couple hundred euros. And uh, if the German companies saw our prices, they would laugh at them, right? Because uh, they're basically uh, charging three, four, five times as much as, as we do. So, um, uh, you know, so already it's, um, I think there's a lot to be said about. Um, you know, markets and morality and how the commodification of death and dying, the very funeral industry uh, has a big reputation problem because um, they are viewed by many members of the public as profiting from people's grief and distress and in their most vulnerable moments. Uh, you know, I think after Jessica Mitford wrote her book, The American Way of Death, you know, the, the funeral industry in this country had a big PR problem because all of a sudden she portrayed them as kind of vultures or merchants of death. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of what I've seen um, 
the way that the discourse has shifted, right, is um, a lot more uh, interjections of therapeutic language, right, uh, of kind of grief counseling, grief management. Uh, you have a whole host of alternative funerary providers that have cropped up in, in the U.S. and Europe in recent years where, you know, they may encourage family members to make it take a more active role in, in the burial and in the sort of processes of um, uh, preparing the dead for, for burial. There's a kind of a therapeutic intervention to help process loss, right? And when I speak with the Muslim undertakers, they say, well, look, you know, the Muslims have had this solution uh, forever because we expect families to take part in the washing and the shrouding and the burial um, you know, this has always been part of our tradition, uh, and now you have these alternative companies coming and saying, hey, look, it's really therapeutic for the family members to take part and kind of charge an extra for this um, intervention. So a lot of that is, uh, there has been some good work done about, you know, the framing and, and the ways in which the funeral industry uh, seeks to overcome sort of negative image or reputation uh, uh, questions by moving away from a discussion of commodification towards more of a, a kind of a medical language of, of healing or processing or, or, or grieving rather than you know, uh, disposal of, of the dead. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to say. Uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts as someone who's been a practitioner in this space. How, uh, if you've noticed any trends related to the ones that I've talk, talking about, or how maybe a kind of a medical discourse helps inform uh, these discussions, or is there anything you can share based on your expertise? Um, I don't want to take up time. It's okay. <laughs> Um, no, I just found a lot of parallels between yeah. your discussion of, you know, the funeral industry in Germany and catering to this very particular group versus what's been in this country and with a lot of, you know, advocacy work being done legislatively as far as, you know, really challenging what's been established, you know, not requiring coffins, you know, yep. ability to pick up someone from the hospital without a funeral home, mm -hmm. you, you know, being there, like all of these things are interventions the industry and the commodification and encourage direct direct like family friends to be involved um but uh i mean and also i was just interested in um your idea of necropatriotism yeah. i would love to hear you speak more about that sure. Can I take that? yes so, so maybe i'll collect because okay. we have one more online let me just see if anyone else in the I'm room off, okay so um we'll we'll uh, okay. answer about ne a necro patriotism I have a question and Anna has another question. So Anna's question is a second, a different question about selection or self-selection. Did the undertakers you interviewed see a class or education difference between those who chose to be buried in Germany versus uh, having the body sent back to Turkey? Mm -hmm. um, and your quote suggested that this is more a reflection of how integrated immigrants are and whether their family, you know, they have family kids, um, who will remain in Germany. So it's this kind of social class versus assimilation. Um, okay, so that's the second question. And then for me, um, you know, in, in this, uh, throughout our conversation, I was thinking about the mechanics of border crossings um, and like, do dead bodies need visas? Like, how do we, how do we, um, like, how does it actually work? Yeah, like, yes. <laughs> even in death, we need visas. Um, so maybe without getting too into the, the process of so the first question, necro patriotism, then social class versus assimilation, and then uh, visas after death. It's called the Lycian Pass, which means like a corpse passport, basically. Wow. There are, there's a kind of an international, um, set of agreements that um, uh, mandate uh, uh, certain um, standards uh, and requirements for transporting bodies across borders, technical things like a hermetically sealed coffin mm -hmm. and all these things. So, so there, is a, there is a regulation that is uh, overseen by, um, I think it's the IATA. Okay. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, basically sets the ground rules for transporting. So 
you know, there's always usually if you want to do an international repatriation, you have to visit the consulate or the embassy and get the proper papers for the transfer as, as if it were within person crossing the border. But um, there's a specific, um, you know, I don't know if I call it a visa or like a pass, but you know, it's usually very quick and you just need to be quite. Yeah. Quick, so. So, <laughs> no biometrics. No biometrics here. Um, um, but you know, where it does become, you know, sometimes a challenge is that, you know, uh, proving sometimes if there's, you know, proving citizenship, proving, you know, for people who are dual citizens, you know, bringing in all the documents that proves residency and there's still a kind of a massive bureaucratic process. And I think this for a lot of people in a moment of grief, um, becomes just an infuriating mm -hmm. uh, uh, set of obstacles to overcome. And what I was uh, sharing earlier about the kind of temporal logic of the bureaucracy, not being so accommodating to the biological uh, rhythms of life and death, I think this becomes an issue where, um, you know, families get really frustrated. I have some stories in the book uh, talking about where Families try to take matters into their own hands by, you know, storming the hospital or saying, hey, let's all split up and hit all these different offices one by one. Uh, but the undertakers are always reflecting about how, like, it doesn't matter if you have an army of people, you know, what you need is the paper, the piece of paper that is going to allow you to get the next piece of paper that's going to allow you to get the next piece of paper so that you can put together all your documents in order to um, proceed with the repatriation. Um, so, uh, on the question of um, uh, kind of social class and the distinctions. Yeah, is there a class? Is there, you know, this social class versus assimilation when it comes to these decisions to be buried in Germany or go back or, or you know, go back? It sure. may not be, a, sure. you know, as you said, not everyone has an immediate migrant background. Right? Yes, I mean, um, Again, it's, it's it's hard for me to generalize because in each interview I did, there was such a complex constellation of um, you know reasons given for certain preferences, and sometimes they contradicted one another. Right. So, for example, one thing I'll point out is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Muslims believe that a body should be buried as soon as after death as possible, usually within 24 hours. And that's because of the belief that the body is still sentient and can feel pain until it is put into the ground, right? Um, as you heard for, about this repatriation, sometimes they can take a week or so, depending on what day of the week and, you know, the, the offices that are open or closed. And uh, for some people, you know, when I ask them about this, you know, hey, look, you know, there's a matter that, you know, this burial wasn't achieved in, in, in 24 hours. And they say, well, it would have been nice if we could have done it faster, but the body got to where it should go. And therefore, I'm willing to overlook this temporal injunction uh, for a swift burial. And, that, and that's a point I developed in the book where, you know, often we think of religious beliefs and dictates as being very rigid, inflexible. You know, orthodox, um, you know, these are laws that you can't break. But I found that practically, when people were approaching these questions, right, um, you saw that sometimes the imperatives of the religion uh, could be bended a little bit uh, because what was more important was, you know, getting the body to its proper place. Um, I think, in terms of distinctions between class and, and sort of education and, and so on. I mean, of course, there are, you know, uh, Turkish origin uh, communities in Germany who are not religious, who are not uh, believers, who are not Muslims, and the undertakers did uh, speak about them. And for them, uh, you know, sometimes uh, it, it, they didn't face some of these challenges because they didn't see the need to be buried in an Islamic cemetery, it didn't matter. Some of them may have wanted to be cremated, right? And so, uh, you know, one kind of distinction I think we could make is between believers and non-believers. But even among the believers, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, religious dictates were um, uh, a bit more flexible than is commonly assumed. Um, the 
could certainly, I mean, if I had done maybe, uh, you know, most of my empirical data comes from interviews that I conducted and, um, you know, if I had the ability maybe to run a larger survey where I could do a more systematic comparison along lines of gender, age, class, education, uh, maybe a kind of a composite picture would emerge of, you know, what is the kind of prototype of the person who seeks weekly creation versus the prototype of the person who uh, seeks local burial. But even within that composite picture, I think, if you get to the story and you start asking questions, and this is what I love about doing an interview-based research is you can see the complexity and the contradiction, even as people are working out in real time what their ideas are, um, that doesn't always sort of neatly align on you know, the, 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 the key by the or something like this. But I think uh, all these factors do play a role I wish I could offer a, a more systematic answer, um, but perhaps that will be a, a survey that someone can answer. Um, we're actually over time, so I'm okay. going to um, uh, wrap up, but I know that maybe we can inf yeah. informally continue the conversation in the room. I just want to make a plug for our next speaker that um, Pascal Labrouillet uh, is a sociologist. Um, and then and, uh, her, her piece, I mean, her talk is going to be about scholars in exile. It's going to be aligned with an art exhibit. So I hope you'll join us. That's on March 5th. Um, and again, thank you so much to, to uh, uh, Professor Balkin for, for joining us in this um, event today. Thank, thank you, you all for coming. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. Thank you on Zoom. Thank you. <laughs>